You did very well and, and very clearly. So you can see there's a lot left and there's a lot of possibilities here. And uh, I think even manslaughter may go to the jury. It's never used here, I understand, but there is a heat of passion manslaughter. So I think one question is, will the defense ask for that? Will the judge give that? Okay, let's bring Jeff Gold in on this part of the conversation. Jeff, he's been in that courtroom as well. Jeff, what are you seeing here? As you, yeah, you I'll, let me borrow the phrase, read the tea leaves. You, you hear the jury questions, many of them very cynical. What are you seeing here as you've watched the evidence roll by us here to this point? Well, uh, where we're at is uh, the state's expert, Jean DeMar Jeanine DeMarte, is now off the stand. Uh, she did a bang-up job on direct. There were some questions about her light credentials and maybe not as, as many credentials in the area of DV on cross-examination. But yesterday was a huge battle in court between Jennifer Wilmot and uh, Jeanine DeMarte, which I think Jean DeMarte in the end wins. We ended with some very, very interesting juror questions, not as many as as we've had for some other experts or for Jody, but there were two questions in particular that struck me as some concern for the state. One juror asked, does it matter if you're afraid uh, of a bear or a tiger? And I think what that means is, what does it matter if Jody wrote down on her uh, test that she was afraid of two ninjas or she, the, the truth, according to Jody today, Travis Alexander. That would go towards the defense case. And another interesting question that they asked was, uh, if she left the camera behind, does that show a lack of, and this was the juror's word, organization? And I think that's the lay term he's thinking for premeditation. Right. So those are two questions that Juan Martinez is going to need to address. And when I listen to juror questions, I'm not concerned about the answers as much as I am. What's in the juror's mind? Yeah. What is the question they're answering? Asking. Yeah, good point. And we're going to get digging a little deeper into those juror questions. Uh, great point, you guys. And again, we'll have more on the Jody Arias trial. i got to get a clarification on what Jody Arias was at Travis's house. Boy, imagine that image the jury now has, Jeff. Uh, showing up unannounced, hiding behind a Christmas tree. It's pretty big stuff. That's right, and the only thing that's missing right now is, is if Juan could only get in the allegation that she slashed his tires. Um, you know, that is something that has not been able to be uh, connected up by the prosecutor that Jody did it and probably never can be, although there is a secret hearing this morning. Who knows what that's about? Um, all the things add up to, uh, A, the borderline personality disorder, which was great that, uh, that Dr. DeMarte testified because I think that we've been sitting here for months trying to figure out who is Jody Arias, what makes her tick, and finally we got some explanation of it. We really got none from the defense. Everything was about uh, Travis being the uh, aggressor and, and Jody being a victim, but no explanation for some of the weirder conduct, like her smiling like it's a high school yearbook picture for her mugshot. Right. So these things have been explicatory to us, and her hiding behind a, a Christmas tree or going through the doggy door. And as I say, everybody suspects she slashed right. the tires, but it can't be proven yet. These things are very dramatic for okay. one. They're and it's LaViolette, a lot of years experience, but again, you're looking at DeMarty, who, who has come off, she's come off as objective, don't you think? Uh, I do. I think that uh, Alice's problem uh, is that although she has a lot of experience, as you notice, she doesn't have hardly any experience in a courtroom, number one. And number two, she seemed to approach the case as if she was doing this as a thesis or a seminar. And she was talking in such uh, hypotheticals that um, it didn't apply to a murder case, really, because all this domestic violence is, is one thing. Maybe there was abuse. Who knows? But did it make her afraid uh, for her life? And Alice never got that. She was 100% on the defense side, and that hurt her credibility. Real quick, Jeff. And, and Jean and just a real quick point on that. When you Again, we're at this point in the case. The experts are in front and center. Does a jury really lock in on these experts? Are they still thinking about the 18 days of Jody Arias? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think you can ever get past the fact that the defendant testified for 18 days. Um, when a defendant testifies, almost everything else can go out the window because the jury is taking the measure okay. of the woman in this case. Uh, and I think, by the way, Jack, Dr. DeMarty did an excellent job for the state considering her lack of experience. All right, we're back with more job. of Travis when we come back. Well, you know, that's a really interesting question, Mike, because, you know, this case has been focused on Jody Arias and Travis as an aggressor. 
because the defense has been up there for what 80 days or, or something compared to 15 days or so for the uh, state. Uh, it's a really odd thing. I mean, the state can't put all that much in just about Travis, whereas because of the defense in the case, Jody's been able to sit there and say every facet of her life. And what we hear about Travis is, is mostly the negative. Uh, you know, we hear that, uh, uh, you know, he's uh, uh, into sex. We hear that uh, he's writing texts that make him look abusive. Uh, mm. We hear that he had a poor upbringing or, you know, an upbringing where he had to live in a tent after being abandoned. Uh, it, it's really a, it's a very, very good question. Yeah. You know, even Alice LaViolette said, yeah, he had a lot of good qualities, but she's also was talking about abuse as a backdrop. We're back to Boston in a moment. You know, that's absolutely true. The characters that developed in the O.J. Simpson case, of course, that was more of a mystery. So from the limo driver, even the person who heard the plaintiff wail of the dog in the night, and then, of course, Cato Kalin, some of these characters, and you mentioned Judge Ito, the lawyers, very memorable. In this case, equivalent to Cato Kalin is Ryan Burns. I sat next to Ryan Burns after he testified uh, on another uh, network, and uh, I had an opportunity to speak to him in a a casual setting and I'm gonna tell you something you know this takes a trial like this takes an ordinary person and elevates them into a whole different world of media that they're not used to uh, so yeah I mean that's a great series that you're gonna do yeah I mean we're kind of jump starting us here but hey let's go for it Gene let's talk about the first yeah. category up the prosecutors Jeff Ashton there were signs in Orlando